All right. So quantum bounding theory. We talked about the molecular orbital theory last lecture. More in detail, we were talking about how to create approximate molecular orbitals by linear combination of atomic orbitals. Right, so this is what we're doing. What we did was called the LCAOMO. So LCAO, it stands for linear combination of atomic orbitals. Right, so in LCAOMO theory, we're using molecular orbitals that's coming from the linear combination of atomic orbitals. When we say linear combination, what we're meaning is when you put two atomic orbitals that are essentially just wave functions together, right? So these waves will interfere with each other, either constructive or destructive fashion. Let's use the hydrogen atom again as an example. So what we did is we start from the atomic orbital of hydrogen. So in this case, we're talking about the 1s atomic orbitals. And then when these two atomic orbitals meet each other, they can interfere in a constructive fashion to create a bonding MO. Right, so if they are of the same shade, they interfere with each other in the constructive fashion to create a bonding MO. So the bonding molecular orbital is expected to be lowering energy comparing to the atomic orbital it starts with. So that's where that bonding MO comes from. Alternatively, the two atomic orbitals can interfere with each other via an anti-bonding fashion. So the result here is your atomic orbitals interfere with each other via the anti-bonding fashion, means your, molecular or your atomic orbital have different shading. So the result there is the creation of an anti-bonding molecular orbital with a node. All right, so the take home message here, you start from two atomic orbital, you end up with two molecular orbitals, one bonding, one anti-bonding. The bonding molecular orbital comes from the constructive interference of your starting wave functions. And your anti-bonding molecular orbital comes from the destructive interference of your atomic orbitals. Once we created this MO correlation diagram, you can subsequently put electrons in there. So the way we do it is you count the number of electrons available in your starting atoms. In this case, for both hydrogen atoms, we have one electron available. So in total, we have two electrons. You put those electrons into the lowest lying molecular orbitals, like what we did with the electron configuration. So that's a quick summary on our last lecture when we were talking about the LCAO molecular orbital, which is one of the lead quantum bonding theories. One of the take home message here is the molecular orbitals, it gives you a very nice picture of what the energy level of your um, electron of your electrons in your new molecule right we can easily estimate where your bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbital lies and what is your molecular electron configuration so the advantages of your molecular orbital theory gives you a better description on the energy level but there is a clear problem so one of the things you might notice is that the electrons are fully delocalized over the entire molecule. What it means is if we look at H2 here, the electrons are totally delocalized in this bonding molecular orbital. It's not, there doesn't exist something called a localized chemical bond looking at your MO theory a lot. Right, what we're predicting here is your electrons are fully delocalized. You have higher electron density in between the hydrogen atoms, which creates a chemical bond, but the position of these electrons are still delocalized. It's not that well defined. One of the alternative ways to think about it is molecular orbitals can get really complicated, even when you just have a simple molecule like um, methane, like CH4. Right, so in H2, it's easy to imagine your electrons being delocalized, but in CH4, 
your bonding electrons are also delocalized. So MO theory doesn't tell you too much about the connectivity between atoms using MO theory alone. So that's one of the shortage or disadvantage of using molecular orbital theory. We'll go over that a little bit more in detail in our next Monday's lecture, but that part will not be on the um, midterm two. So today, what we want to introduce is a different quantum mechanics bonding theory, which is called valence bond theory, right? So we have two different quantum mechanics bonding theory. The first one called molecular orbital theory, where your MOs are created by the superposition or linear combination of your atomic orbitals. So that's the first theory. That's what we discussed in our last lecture. We have another theory that's called valence bond theory. So valence bond theory also provides quantum mechanical description of your um, electron density. But using the valence bond theory, it gives you a more localized picture on your electron density. The reason behind the more localized electron density picture is that the valence, wave, the, the valence bond wave function, or VB wave function here, instead of taking the superposition of your atomic orbital, it's created by the product of the two atomic orbitals. So if you think about it, in the definition of your Schrodinger equation, right, your wave function squared gives you probability. Or, in more detail, it's a probability to find the electron somewhere in space. So by taking the product of different atomic orbitals, valence bond theory gives you a better description of where your electron density is predicted to be in a molecule. Right, so that's the fundamental difference between valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. MO theory, you're taking two atomic orbitals, you plus or minus them together, and you get a description on your molecular orbital. So that's MO theory. Valence bond theory, you're taking the product of two atomic orbitals. It's giving you um, the probability density or electron density estimation. All right? So a little bit of the work through on what valence bond theory is doing, and then we'll see some examples in how to use the valence bond theory in describing chemical bonds. Like what we did with the MO theory, we started by imagining a situation where two atoms, we're using hydrogen again as an example, are infinitely apart. So the distance here between atom A and atom B is approaching infinity. In this scenario, it is easy to imagine that each nuclei will hold its own electron, right? So there's no, there's no differences, right? Each atom is holding its own electron. There's no chemical bond when the distance is approaching infinity. Or the other way to put it is let's just say electron one is with nuclei A, electron two is with nuclei B. Or we can write that wave function. This is the valence bond wave function. So it's a function of small r1a, small r1b, and big rab. So r1a describes the distance of your electron to your nuclei A. r1b is the distance between electron to your nuclei B. RAB is the distance between your nuclei A and B. And what we are having here, that C is a constant. We don't need to worry about it. This RAB is the distance. And then the small phi A, that's the atomic orbital of hydrogen atom A. And small phi b, that's our atomic orbital of Hb. Right, so it's quite straightforward. Electron 1 is with nuclear A. So that's a nuclear A, that's electron 1. And then electron 2 is with nuclear B. So electron 2 is with nuclear B. 
So that's a scenario when there's no chemical bond. You just have two different atoms that are not interacting with each other yet. What I want you to know is, for example, if I gave you this equation, can you like what we're doing here? Tell me what's the physical meaning of each terms in this seemingly complicated equation. Question. Oh, this one should be two. Thank you for pointing that out. OK. All right, so this is when they're infinitely apart. They're not forming a chemical bond yet. And then when we're looking at it, well, we have the distance between atom A and atom B coming closer to that equilibrium bond length when there is a bond formation. The result here is the electron density starts to mix with each other. Or the other way to put it is that electrons between the atom will become indistinguishable with each other. We no longer know which electron belongs to which nuclei or those two electrons in between in that molecule H2 now, we don't know which electron comes from which nuclei. So the result here is coming to a valence bound wave function of a shared electron pair. So what we have here, again, on the left hand side, this is our valence bound wave function. And what we have here is now we have two different possibilities. The first possibility <coughs> here is electron A, electron 1, with nuclei A. So that's where that 1 and A comes from. And electron 2 with nuclei B. That's where that 2 comes from. There are two different ways you can write this uh, valence bound expression. The idea here, here is this is a C, that's a constant. That's a distance we were talking about. That's atomic orbital A, atomic orbital B. You can also replace that atomic orbital with the actual 1s atomic orbital and 1s atomic orbital here. And now I'm having a new C that taking consideration of the equilibrium boundless. So there are two different ways to write them. They're just equivalent to each other. Both of them are correct. Anyhow, so the other way to think about it is you can have one way to have your electron, electron one with atom A, electron two with atom B. Or you can also have electron two with nuclei A, so that's where that 2 and A comes from, and also electron 1 with nuclei B. All right, so in the valence bond wave function, what we're doing is, again, you can have linear combination of different possibility, but each possibility here is giving you a product of different atomic orbitals. What I want you to know, the take home message for this part is to know the valence bond wave function comes from product of different atomic orbitals. And for example, if I gave you an equation like this, you need to know what's the physical meaning of each term. Or alternatively, if I tell you in a scenario, can you write out an expression for the valence bond wave function, like what we did here in class? <coughs> All right. Any questions before we move on? Yes. Well, it's it's relatively speaking just a combination, right? If you think about it, what's the physical meaning of this picture here? What we have is a nuclei A and a nuclei B. Now we have electron one, electron two. We don't know which electron comes from which nuclei. So there must be a, a scenario where electron 1 is with nuclei A, electron 2 is with nuclei B. And also you can replace that 1 and 2 and get another possibility. So it's just look at your physical meaning of what is happening in that chemical bond and write out all the possible combinations there. Right, so the yellow area is where the high electron density is, or the localized electron density is. 
we'll see a bit more example here in how to use the valence bond theory in chemistry. So this is what I expect you to know how to do, which is to create graphic representation using the valence bound wave function. Right? You don't need to actually solve that mathematical equation, but given the shape of your atomic orbital, can you sketch graphical representation of these valence bound wave functions? So here are some of the procedures we'll be using, and then we'll do some examples together. The procedure here reads, first you want to use the Lewis dot diagram and then VSEPR to determine what the skeleton, molecular skeleton of your target molecule looks like. And then you can write the electron configuration of the atoms to identify the contributing atomic orbitals. Or in this case, in valence bound theory, we're just looking at atomic orbitals with an unpaired electron. Right? So that's a pure valence bound theory <coughs> setup. It's a little bit different from the molecular orbital setup. You can also write the valence bound wave function from there, and also the graphical representation of the electron density. So I'll leave this instruction here, and then we'll do some All right. Let's start from a single bond example, F2. So I already draw the Lewis dot diagram here. It's relatively straightforward. Let's just imagine on the left I have Fa, on the right I have Fb. So for each fluorine atom, you can imagine to write the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. 2p x2, 2p y2, and 2p z1. So here, because of my three p orbitals are actually degenerate in energy, we're just manually define that pz atomic orbital is always used to create a sigma bond or the single bond between two atoms. So this is just manually defined. And what we're doing here is to take product. So that's the first step, right? We draw the Lewis dot diagram to determine the molecular skeleton. Then we write out electron configuration to figure out what are the contributing atomic orbitals. So in this case, we know that 2pz is a contributing atomic orbital. And then what we're doing is write the valence bound wave function. So we're talking about product of the two, 2pz. Atomic orbitals. And we're manually defining it. So when you have two, 2pz interacting with their, each other, we manually define that to be a sigma bond. So sigma bond comes from interaction of s orbitals and 2pz orbitals well, PZ orbitals in general. So next step, what we're writing is the valence bond wave function. So let's imagine phi sigma here, because it is a sigma bond, equals to some kind of constant. And what we have here is a 2PZ of atom A holds the first electron times 2pz of atom B holds the second electron and plus 2pz of atom A holds the second electron and 2pz of atom B holds the first electron. And so here is just writing out the possible combination. You have two different atomic orbitals. You have two electrons. You don't know which electron comes from which atom. You're just taking both combination together and add up together to be your valence bound wave function here. Again, what we're having here is this is electron one with fluorine A, electron two with fluorine B. That's one possibility. 
on the right hand side, you can also have electron 2 with fluorine A and electron 1 with fluorine B. Nothing fancy, it's just to get familiar in these notations and how to write that wave function expression. All right, so that's our step three, how to write the valence bound wave function. Step four here is how to draw graphical representation of the electron density. So what we have is let's just draw the fluorine center as what we have predicted. It's going to be a linear structure. And you draw the p atomic orbitals. So we always define the direction of that sigma bound to be my z-axis. So my pz will have this kind of shape. So since the wave function, well, the valence bound wave function is a product of two atomic orbitals, they're all shaded or not shaded. We're talking about electron density here. So valence bond sketches are all shaded because they're representing electron density. Alternatively, when you draw, remind you of the LCAO, that's different. You might have node plans and different shadings in your anti-bonding and bonding MOs. All right, so that's a single bond scenario. Let's do one more example with multiple bonds. So this is the single bond scenario where we're just following the four different steps to write out the valence bound wave function and eventually draw a graphical representation. There's no mystery here. You're just drawing the atomic orbitals, and then you just imagine them interacting with each other. But in this case, the, in the valence, valence bound theory case, what we're having is the electron density, so we shade everything. All right? Moving on to next example, now we have N2, nitrogen. So N2, that's there, what we have. I have already drawn the loose dot diagram. There's no mystery. It's pretty much just a linear structure. The first step, you draw the loose dot diagram and find out it's a linear structure. Second step, you write the electron configuration of the atoms and identify singly paired atomic orbitals that are going to interact with each other. So let's imagine here nitrogen, that's 1s2, that's not going to contribute, 2s2, 2px1, 2py1, 2pz1. So all of them are singly occupied. So imagine, again, this is a quick review why these p atomic orbitals are singly occupied. So we have the 2s and 2p. When you put the electron in, you put them singly occupied first before you pair them up to avoid the electron pairing energy. So this is a quick review on why the p atomic orbitals in nitrogen are singly occupied. So once we know that, now we know there are three different p atomic orbitals are involved in forming chemical bond in your N2 molecule. In here, we were talking about the 2pz always forms the sigma bond, and then your 2px and 2py will actually give you pi bonds. So let's look at the sigma bond first. Again, our next step is to write the valence bound wave function. The two z atomic orbitals forms this. What we have is valence bound function phi sigma equals to some constant times 
two pz of your nitrogen atom A has electron one. Two pz of your atom B holds electron two. Plus, these two electrons can switch position. So two pa with electron two times two pz B with electron one. Nothing fancy. You're just trying to think about what are the possible expression to put that electron with different atomic orbitals. And then to sketch it, again, let's define this direction of your nitrogen-nitrogen bond to be your z-axis. So what we have is let's just sketch the 2p z atomic orbitals as electron density. So everything shaded. So that's a sketch of our sigma bond in nitrogen. Yes. So we only look at 2pz for the sigma bond. We haven't talked about the pi bond yet. So for sigma bond, we use our 2pz first to make a sigma bond. If there are additional unpaired electrons in your px and py atomic orbitals, we're coming there right away, talking about the formation of the pi bond. Right, so our next step is talking about two pairs of 2px and 2py atomic orbitals to form pi bonds. So I'll skip writing the valence bond wave function part. You can check your result with the annotated note. And let's just think about what your pi bond will look like. So this is your nitrogen. Again, I'm defining the direction here to be z. And then you can have x and y accordingly. We already talked about the pz atomic orbital. So that's coming from the 2pz atomic orbitals. And now let's imagine what your pi atomic orbital looks, pi um, valence bond molecular orbital looks like. So starting from the px, here is the direction of your x um, axis or where your px atomic orbitals will align. So you can imagine that's your px atomic orbital. And the interaction here creates our first pair. I'm just going to not shade them, not shade everything, because it's just electron density. And the interaction here between your green atomic orbitals are your 2px with another 2px, creates your first pi bond. So if you imagine here, you have, that's your sigma bond, right, where your orbitals are pointing towards each other, then your pi bond is like this way, aligned this way. Alternatively, you can also have your QPY atomic orbitals interacting with each other to form your pi Y bond. So what we are doing here is you're just drawing the atomic orbitals and imagine how they can interact with each other, right? So the way we're thinking about it here is the blue one, the interacting of the two PZ are pointing toward each other, it forms a sigma bond. And then the interaction with your PX and PY gives you two sets of the, of the pi bonds. In this case, we're not shading it because we're talking about electron density in valence bond theory. So there's no need to shade these valence bond molecular orbitals. Yes. And they're not close, they're perpendicular to each other. So if you imagine this is, yeah, it's actually a different drawing. So PX, PY, and PZ, all three of them are perpendicular to each other. Okay. So that's for the pure valence bond theory. 
But there is a problem when we're using valence bond theory in chemical bonding. For these diatomic molecules, it's pretty straightforward. But when we're looking at scenarios, when you're trying to use valence bond theory for polyatomic molecules, like CH3, NH3, or in this case, beryllium H2 as an example. If we look at beryllium H2, we have beryllium to be our 1s2, 2s2, and hydrogen to be 1s1. So remember, in your valence bond theory, you need atomic orbital with unpaired electron to form a chemical bond. So apparently, when we're talking about chemical bond in beryllium H2, we're having a big problem here. There is no unpaired electron in your beryllium. So that's the first problem. The second problem is now we're talking about 2s interacting with 1s of hydrogen. So if we draw it out, we'll have beryllium in the center. So that's our 2s and hydrogen. 1s. Right, so there's very small overlap between your S atomic orbitals in beryllium and in hydrogen. So the problem coming here is small overlap. And we're just not happy because there's not enough overlap to make chemical bonds. Naturally, one would think about the PZ atomic orbitals, right? So if you, if you draw it, the two PZ atomic orbitals of beryllium, this works perfectly fine interacting with the 1s of hydrogen. But then the problem is in beryllium, the two PZ doesn't have any electrons in there. So that's why we want to introduce the concept of hybridization. You'll hear the term hybridization a lot in organic chemistry, but I do hope we give you a full explanation in where that hybridization comes from and why do we need it in order to describe our chemical bond in polyatomic atoms. So here is the fundamental theory here. What we're trying to do is to solve the three problems we mentioned before, right? So in beryllium H2, we only have all paired up electrons in your S atomic orbitals in beryllium. It doesn't like to form a chemical bond according to the pure valence bond theory. So in the promotion and hybridization theory, what we're having here is first imagine electrons in a paired ground state can get promoted to a higher state. So what it means, imagine for beryllium, it's in ground state. And its all share electron configuration is a 2s2 configuration. By right? both electrons are in the 2s atomic orbitals. What we're proposing is now it's promoting one of the electrons onto your 2pz atomic orbitals. Hypothetical excited state. It's not a real excitation. It's just mentally we're imagining a hypothetical excitation. To form a 2s1, 2p1. But one of the problem here, and this hypothetical excitation requires a lot of promotion energy delta E1, or promotion energy. All right, so the first step is we're trying to get the electrons unpaired to form chemical bonds. The second step, now we need to deal with that large promotion energy from the first step. What we're going to do is to hybridize it. So remember what we're doing here is to promote it from 2s to 2pz. The alternative way to think about it is your 2s and 2pz can mix with each other to form a hybridized molecular orbital, or atomic orbital, I'm sorry. Hybridized atomic orbital. We're just talking about the beryllium itself. So instead of having <coughs> 
one, two S atomic orbital, and three, two P atomic orbital. We're imagining a mix of your two S and two P Z atomic orbital and form these hybridized atomic orbitals. So now if you think about it, the promotion energy between your 2s and your hybridized sp atomic orbitals are much smaller because we're already mixing the 2s and 2p atomic orbitals here. All right, so two steps. The first step, we're promoting one electron from the 2s to the 2p atomic orbital. So now both electrons are, hybridized, uh, are singly occupied and can make chemical bonds. Second step to deal with that big promotion energy, we hybridize a S atomic orbital with whatever P atomic orbital that is involved. So in the beryllium case, we're just um, hybridize a 2S atomic orbital with a 2P atomic orbital to form what we call an SP atomic orbital. And now we have a smaller promotion energy. All right. So naturally, the next question comes, what is the shape of your hybridized atomic orbitals? So this is how we draw it. SP atomic orbitals, we're just talking about the combination of 2S and 2PZ. Right, so if we draw that out, it's just a linear combination of my 2S and my 2PZ. And depending on how you shade it, right, the S orbital is always going to be shaded in a uniform way. But your P atomic orbitals may have two different shading. So this gives you one of the SP hybridized atomic orbitals. Or if we draw it in a different way, here the shading is a little bit bigger. Here it's a little bit smaller. Right. You can easily imagine your 2P has a different shading. So that's what we have here. So 2S is always going to be the same. But my 2P now is shaded from a different direction. And the result here is the SP atomic orbital of a different orientation. And the logic is the same. You start from two atomic orbitals. They mix and hybridize with each other to form two hybridized atomic orbitals. So in the hybridization theory, what we're having is we start from two atomic orbitals, and we end up with two hybridized atomic orbitals. So how does it help when we're using the hybridized atomic orbitals trying to explain um, the chemical bond in beryllium H2? So let me just leave these here. And now we're moving on to talk about the chemical bond in your beryllium H2 with hybridization now. First, we have our newly drawn hybridized atomic orbitals with the sp atomic orbitals. That's after the hybridization, right? We start from promotion to then hybridization to give you two singly occupied sp atomic orbitals. So this is the electron configuration, the new electron configuration after hybridization. And we have also drawn the shape of these sp atomic orbitals. Remember that where this comes from? These just come from the drawing we just did here. We're just overlapping a s atomic orbital with a 2pz atomic orbital. And depending on the shading of your 2pz atomic orbital, your sp atomic orbital have two different orientations. 
All right, with me so far? So I'm here, I'm just copy paste what we did on our last page to the new um, picture here for beryllium H2. And now we're ready to make a chemical bond between your newly hybridized sp atomic orbital and the s atomic orbital of hydrogen. So what we have here is, again, in beryllium hydrogen, it's going to be a linear geometry. So the picture now becomes we have the S1S of your first hydrogen interacting with one of the SP atomic orbital of your beryllium. And at the same time, your beryllium also have a different sp atomic orbital to interact with H2. Again, the reason we have two sp hybridized atomic orbital is because we're creating the sp atomic orbital from one, the linear combination of 1, 2s and 1, 2pz. So you start from two atomic orbital, you end up with two hybridized atomic orbital. You cannot just create it from void. It needs to come from some atomic orbitals. Or taken together, what we are sketching here is the full picture. So in the center, we have our beryllium. It casts two different hybridized atomic orbitals. And then each hybridized atomic orbitals is interacting with a hydrogen. I might also ask you to label what are the interaction here. So for that, you want to say this one is the sp interacting with 1s of hydrogen. And likewise, this interaction is also sp of beryllium interacting with 1s of hydrogen. And since in valence bond theory, when we're making the valence bond, when we're making that sigma bond in valence bond theory, and also pi bonds, you don't need to consider about shading it differently because we're talking about electron density here. All right. Okay, so let's do one more example here. SP2 hybridization. Now, instead of beryllium H2, which is a linear structure, now we can imagine boron H3, which has a trigonal planar geometry. So this you can refer back to the VSEPR and remember why BH3 is a trigonal planar geometry. The first step here is to draw the hybridized sp atomic orbitals. The way we're doing it is, again, imagine in boron, where we start from is two electrons in 2s and just one electron in one of the 2p atomic orbitals. After promotion and hybridization, what we want is three singly occupied atomic orbitals. So what we're doing is mixing the 2s with two 2p atomic orbitals. So that's where we end up with. All right. Then what we can do is to draw the shapes of the sp atomic orbitals. When drawing the sp atomic orbitals, the sp2 hybridized atomic orbitals, the logic here is the same. We're just super, we're trying to make a superposition between your S and multiple P atomic orbitals. So in this case, different from there, where we only have one 2S and one 2P atomic orbital, now we have two S and two P atomic orbitals. So the result it's gonna show is for example, here in the center, you have your two S 
And then depending on how you shade it, you can have three different sp atomic orbitals. So this is just one of the example. I'm just going to change the shading here to give you a idea. So imagine this one, and then I shade this differently. I'm just shading the two px differently. So now that superposition will lead you to a different orientation of your new hybridized sp2 atomic orbital. And likewise, you can do the shading of your 2py differently and get a different orientation. So in total, we have three sp2 atomic orbitals because that sp2 tells you it comes from one s atomic orbital and two p atomic orbitals. That's, that's why you have three sp2 atomic orbitals there. All right. So once we know your hybridized atomic orbitals, once we have the electrons in our singly occupied atomic orbitals, the hybridized atomic orbitals, we're ready to make chemical bonds for our boron S3, um, for our BH3 molecule. So what we have here are your hybridized atomic orbitals interacting with the hydrogen atom to form a chemical bond. So each of them, each of these red ones, has one sp2 hybridized atomic orbitals. And taking them together, what we have is a Chignol bipyramidal. So I'm just copy paste everything down. Here. All right, so each of this term, each of this interaction here is the sp2 of boron interacting with the 1s of hydrogen to form a sigma bond. Or the other way to put it is that's a sigma bond that's coming from sp2 of boron to 1s of hydrogen. The same logic also applies when you have sp3 hybridization, right? So things start to become quite obvious here. What we're doing is you're just starting from, say, carbon. Now we're talking about the tetrahedral geometry. You have four total electrons, and we want them to be four singly occupied atomic orbitals. So what we're doing is hybridize at 2s with 3p atomic orbitals. And that's why we have sp3 hybridization. right? So sp3 tells you this hybridized atomic orbital comes from 1 s atomic orbital and 3p atomic orbital. That's where that 4 comes from. Likewise, you can draw the shape of these sp3 hybridized atomic orbitals. They're just linear combination of your p atomic orbitals and then 1s atomic orbitals. Now, the drawing of these tetrahedral atomic orbitals become a little bit more challenging. I'm not going to ask you to draw it, but you need to know where that comes from. So each of these drawing, each of these hybridized orbital contains a superposition of one S atomic orbital and three different P atomic orbitals. And in our CH4, that's what we have in the center. You have a carbon, and then each of the terminal here is binded to the one S atomic orbital of a hydrogen atom. I'm going to stop here, and we won't have our hybridization of multiple bonds on midterm two. But we'll talk about that in our buffer lecture. I'll stay for questions if you have any.